morning, and thank you for joining the meeting to discuss the new Western Energy and Balanced Market Resource Efficiency Evaluation Enhancement Phase 1B initiative. My name is Alisandra Casillas, representing the Stakeholder Affairs Group here at the ISO, and I will be facilitating today's meeting. And I'm also joined by Guillermo Bautista Alvarete from Market Analysis and Forecasting, along with Danny Johnson from Market Policy and Performance, who will be representing um, on behalf of the ISO. And there were also other several um, ISO representatives listed as panelists who are here to provide support for the meeting. The presentation and other materials related can be found on the initiative webpage. Some housekeeping reminders. This call is being recorded and the video file will be posted on the initiative webpage for information and convenience purposes only. The recordings and any related transcriptions should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. The meeting is structured to stimulate dialogue and engage different perspectives. Please keep comments professional and respectful. Also, please try and be brief and refrain from repeating what has already been said so that we can manage the time efficiently. We will post for questions periodically throughout the meeting. You can raise your hand by selecting the hand icon above the chat window in WebEx. Or if you've joined via audio only, press pound two on your device. Please remember to state your name and affiliation first. You may also send your questions via chat to all panelists. If you need technical assistance during today's meeting, please feel free to send a chat to the event producer. And from here, I will turn it over to Danny. Thanks, Ellie. So we're here today to kick off phase 1B of the Resource Efficiency Evaluation Enhancements Initiative. This is a continuation of phase one uh, as we near the end of phase one, we, we determined that there were some outstanding items that needed a lot more analysis to really understand and to design policy around. So to take to the bolt or to the joint governance for approval, the items that we did have stakeholder consensus on, we bifurcated phase one. Uh, ideally, the phase one A items will be implemented by summer 2022. Again, Right now, we are kicking out phase 1B to try to get the analysis in place to eventually do the policy design uh, to address the outstanding accuracy items. I think it, you could break these down into three main buckets that we uncovered in the first phase of this initiative. Uh, the first was the impact of load conformance. We did some preliminary analysis. Uh, that actually uncovered additional areas that we believe need further analysis, and this would be the relationship between how half schedules are cleared by the KISO. Further, we committed to do more analysis on methods of, to measure uncertainty and try, try to determine what is an appropriate measure of uncertainty uh, for the EIM's RSE. So again, today we're here to mainly let Guillermo go through the analysis that he believes that we need to do as uh, an organization to further the policy development. So with that said, I turn it over to him. At the end, I'll, I'll, I'll be back online to kind of go over our proposed plan for how we want to handle this. Thank you, Danny. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, as Danny indicated, we have done quite a lot of analysis uh, to support the first phase of the initiative, and we believe that we continue to do that in order to have this foundation in factual information to, to keep the discussion about the next stage of the policy. In the last round of the first phase, we received several comments from different participants, and there was a very consistent uh, trend there that uh, it requires more analysis, more foundational understanding of how things are actually working, not only in the resource efficiency evaluation, but also in the real-time market and how that interplays in with the sufficiency test. And we here, we accounted for all this type of comment that we received regarding additional analysis, more information, more data. And as Dan indicated, we are ready to start this phase 1B and we believe the the good way to start that is with providing all these analytics uh, basis to to have a very 
educated discussion in terms of the policy changes. And uh, we posted the notice last week, and we are asking for any written feedback about this uh, scope, and that is due by March 2nd. So if you have any additional information or requests or comments regarding this analysis phase, in addition to what you have already provided in the last round of the first initiative, we would be happy to take that into account. And as you will see through the material, the idea is to start building up the the framework that is going to to be supporting the initiative 1B. Uh, next slide, please. And how we are planning for this? We, we want to be systematic how we approach this analysis. I think something that we learned from the first site is that we were in this uh, uh, one-stop shop at a time, that any time we discuss an item, we realize that we needed to do analytics and support the, with evidence how things were working. And it was a very dynamic uh, uh, interaction of how we were doing the policy with the analytics. We would like to step back a little bit in this uh, approach and try to do it in stages and in phases. And we believe the first phase needs to be really the, the analytics and do all the analysis and information that we can gather in order to provide this educated and guided basis for the policy discussion to happen. And given the fact that it could be quite a, a wide open in terms of what analysis we can do, and we have heard that from different participants, what we're trying to to do here is to, to tackle each of these different areas. And depending on the topic that we want to address, we can tailor a specific analysis to support that uh, policy discussion. And that is the reason we are proposing to have different tracks to cover each of these individual areas that relate to the resource efficiency evaluation. And that, again, will guide the policy in the subsequent phase once we have collected all these analytics and information to, to have a robust uh, basis to, to have the policy discussion. Next slide, please. The, we are not starting from scratch. Uh, for the last year and a half, I believe we have done many iterations of different type of analysis. Everything started with the assessment that we did for the August 2020, and then we moved into the analysis of 2021. We have had several iterations. We have different discussions on some of those through the resource efficiency evaluation policy, some others through the market surveillance committee. Uh, and there is plenty of material there. Uh, we are not going to start from scratch. Uh, we're going to utilize that reference, and we believe that has guided to some extent the, the policy changes that we're implementing in this summer. And, uh, we have that uh, history and we want to leverage on that to expand and further enhance the analytics that we have to do in the area of the resource efficiency evaluation. We have analyzed uh, for specific days, for specific hours, uh, the capacity accounting that we have between the resource efficiency evaluation and the actual market. That is how eventually we identify the need to, to account more accurately the capacity in the resource efficiency evaluation. We have done a very limited analysis about the impact of the load conformance on the IM transfers, and that is something that we discussed last time with the Market Surveillance Committee. We also posted a, an analysis related to the interplay deviation adder, and that was the, the starting point to have a discussion whether we need to have that enhanced or deactivated for, for some time. And we have analyzed the different drivers for which we have come short of the capacity in the real system in comparison to what was accounted for in the resource efficiency evaluation. And the last piece that is, is related, is not the main driver, but it's closely related, is the uncertainty component. We assess since day one how the uncertainty component other play a role in the increasing number of failures in the test. And we have been reporting that through the summer reports and later on DMM took that uh, part of the reporting. And uh, that has put the spotlight into the accuracy of the, of the methodology that we have for the uncertainty calculation. And we understand the, the uncertainty that this, uh, no pun intended here, uh, that it creates in terms of what's coming ahead, because as you know, we are in the middle of the implementation. 
to move from what we call the histogram calculation into the quantile calculation. And we understand the need to be more proactively analyzing how the performance is going to look. And this is one of the specific areas that we want to, to tackle. Next slide, please. What areas in the bigger picture are we expecting to cover? Well, we know that we have to do all these analytics in a more expansive way for the load conformance. If when we analyze in the previous round load conformance, it was limited to a couple of hours, a few intervals for the most critical day. That a point doesn't make a trend, right? We have to be more expansive and cover a wider range of conditions to assess if there is any trend or any information that we can gauge from, from that counterfactual analysis. Along the same line, we understand now better the implications of the interaction between the EIM transfers and the intertire schedules that happens in the real time through the hour ahead scheduling process, the HAS process. And the third component is obviously the uncertainty component, not just for the net load and errors, but also for the intertie deviation. That is a different component, but it still relies on, to some extent, very similar logic of using a, statistic, a statistical approach to estimate a reference value for the requirement. And we don't want to close the door. We have heard very clearly that these are at least the basic areas that we want to cover. And there may be other comments and more scattered through the discussion. And we want to see if there is any other area that we need to consolidate and make it as an explicit uh, track that we have to, to perform the analysis in, in this stage. And uh, these are just the big picture items that we want to cover. As you know, the analysis is going to naturally self-fit as we progress uh, in, the, in the work. And we may expand the area. We may have to cover different areas that we may not expect to do it from first day. That is just the nature of doing the analytics. As we start analyzing, we realize more things and more interplays, and we have to naturally expand to those areas. So this is just to give you the guideline of what is the big picture topics that we want to cover. Next slide, please. Okay, before we go into the specific topics, let me pause and see if we have any questions. Alessandra, uh, Operator? Sure. If you're connected to the computer audio or use the Call Me feature in WebEx, you may enter the question queue using the WebEx raise hand icon located just above the chat panel. You will hear a beep tone when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name and question. If you're just on the phone line and not using the WebEx audio, please dial pound two on your phone to enter the question queue. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name and question. I do see one caller in the queue. Please go ahead, your line is unmuted. Good morning, Guillermo. Um... This is Elvis Foboda at PG&E. Uh, I want to express my gratitude for the effort you're conducting here um, and ask w one uh, question whether th – there seems to be overlap between the analytics you're doing in, in, in this initiative and some of the work you've done around DAME. Will you uh, at some point tie the bow on that, uh, perhaps provide, present a unified picture of some of the uh, – um, uh, findings that you're making and looking at uh, uncertainty in these processes? Because there seems to be a, uh, even though they're, these are two completely independent initiatives to some extent, there's a, a relation between the kinds of, uh, of uh, data that you're discovering or the, the findings you're discovering in doing this work. Yeah, thank you, Ava. And uh, thank you for the question. Yes, I can see your point. I think between the data head market enhancements and this initiative, there is a natural overlapping when it comes to the uncertainty. Uh, they may be formally kind of unrelated because the uncertainty that we have for the real time uh, is tracking on its own and is in, in the implementation phase for this fall 2022. The DIM discussion is more about 
uh, utilizing kind of the same methodology for the uncertainty calculation of the day ahead. So yes, I believe naturally when we go over the topic of the uncertainty calculation and the performance of that, we will have to connect the dots of how that has implications for the uncertainty calculation of the day ahead market enhancements. The other topics, I don't see those to be closely related, but I will hold on that until we really start putting the pieces together of these other areas of analysis. And yeah, uh, potentially at some point, there may be some uh, symbiosis that we have to to realize that is happening between the two efforts. For now, I, I can tell you that we have been touching this as separate tracks, separate efforts, just for the sake of being able to, to support that analytics. And it would be nice that at the end of the day, we can connect the dots and how they interpret one to the other, at least for one area, the uncertainty for sure, that is going to be a, a factor to consider. Great, thank you. And I think that's in a very important area in both of these. So I, I think there, there is certainly a, uh, a, uh, important to, to identify that relationship. Thank you. You're welcome. I do not see any other callers in the question queue as of now. Okay, let me move on. The the first topic is the load conformance. And for the background that you already are familiar with, we did an analysis in the previous round and we found out, we tried to answer the question, uh, how what is the impact of the load conformance in terms of the EIM transfers? And because that may have implications for the flexible ramping test. And we did some specific analysis. We did some counterfactual analysis, taking into account the original market results, uh, making the changes and see what the solution would look like. We were very limited because obviously that requires that we have to effectively rerun the markets. And uh, given the time, we were able just to do a couple of hours. Uh, the expectation here is that we're going to be able to do that more expansively. And the question is still holding there. What is the impact of the load conformance in the EIM transfers and potentially with the interplace of the uh, intertype transactions in the CAISO? The next slide, please, is going to show just as a reference of what we discussed in, in that last round. And this is the two hours of the HASP market where we assessed if we had about 2,600 megawatts, 2, megawatts of load conformance, how that conformance is supported through the market solution. And we classify that as how much goes into additional imports, additional reduction of exports, additional transfers, or additional movement of internal generation, or potentially even infeasibility in the market. And this is how we slice and dice. Uh, for sure, that would be one of the basic metrics that we want to do, but we want to be more expansive, not just in terms of the period we are covering, but also in terms of the implications of that uh, interaction between load conformance and the overall market solution. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the plan? The idea is that we can at least do this, at least for the top five days of 2021, that would be top days based on the peaking condition. And effectively, we're going to take the five days with the highest loads in the system and try to do this analytics. Uh, I'm expecting that we're going to be able to do this for the peak hours, hour ending 13, 14, all the way through hour ending 21, to give us a, a longer time frame of the interaction that happens not just at the peak, but also through the um, afternoon ramp. That will give us a a more natural trend of how things are evolving as the system condition gets tighter and tighter in the in the supplier space. And uh, eventually the, the idea is to try to quantify also how much of that has an interplay or a impact in the resource efficiency evaluation. And uh, as I indicated, these are the main topics. We still have to boil down the specific details of the analytics. And that is one of the reasons we structured the analysis phase, as we will discuss later, to, to have the opportunity to give you a preview of what we are analyzing and come back to the board and see if we have to do additional effort to, to complete the, the analysis. Next slide, please. The second topic, I would say, is closely related to the first one, 
But here the focus is more on the interaction between EIM transfers and the interface schedules. Effectively, the interface schedules coming from the HASP market. HASP is our last opportunity to to optimize and secure uh, hourly transactions in the real time. And as part of the overall optimization, we clear schedules for interties, but also for the EIM market. And that dispatches from the EIM market is going to result in some transfers. There may be some cases, as what we explained in the previous round of analysis, that certain transfers may be indeed supporting, to some extent, exports. And there is no guarantee that the transfers that were clear in the has been run eventually are going to materialize at that level in the real-time market. And we explain in different metrics how, for instance, the transfers that were projected in the has in the FMA market effectively changed dramatically in some critical hours in the real time. And in some cases, actually, it reversed the direction. And when we clear the entire schedules, it's a one-time deal. That is the only opportunity we have in HASP. And after that, they become effectively binding, while the transfers are kind of advisory because they are going to be re-optimized as we progress from HASP to FMM to RTD. And we want to understand and assess the, the interplay that happens between these two dynamics of the, of the real-time market. This was an issue that was discussed and was raised during the previous round of the resource efficiency evaluation initiative. Next slide, please. And just to give you some reference of the analysis that we were doing in the previous round, this was one of the last slides in the discussion with the MSC. And it made just a simple association between the level of exports that were clear in the HASP market versus the amount of transfer imports that we have in the real-time market. And obviously, you can see the, the, the magnitude of each one. Even though we may have about um, 1,300 megawatts of import transfers coming to the CAISO, in the HAS market, we were clearing about 3,700 megawatts of export. And some of them may have been supported by the AM transfers that were cleared in the HAS process. We still have to, to connect these dots and quantify exactly that uh, dynamic. Next slide, please. So with that in mind, this is a second track we want to, to analyze, and specifically analyze the interaction between the HASP intertie scales with the EIM transfers. The same way we are expecting to do more expansively in terms of the time frame, we want to tackle at least the top five days uh, for many uh, peak hours, out in 13 through 21 or so to give us a longer term trend of the dynamics of these uh, two drivers in the market. Next slide, please. The third topic is slightly different. It's not too much about the market per se, but it's more about the inputs that go into either the resource efficiency evaluation or the market. And that has to do with the calculation of the uncertainty requirement. As you very well know, at this stage, we have a current methodology that is based on a specific statistical approach, a very simple approach that is using a histogram approach. We collect a given sample of historical data, we calculate the net load error between FMM and RTD, and then we just hit certain percentiles at 97.5 or 2.5. We derive the upward and downward requirements, and it's a a rolling window of consideration for the historical data. Uh, as part of the flexible ramping enhancement back in 2019, we had a plan to improve that methodology. And this is more of a regression approach methodology that we call the quantile approach. The main difference is that in addition to taking into account all the historical data through the statistical properties of the data sample, we are also using the regressors, which are the inputs to, to the calculation that accounts for the forecast of the load, wind, and solar. That would be more reflective of the conditions that are happening at the time we are assessing the, the requirements. And that has been in track for implementation through the FRP initiative. And as of now, that is scaled to be implemented in fall 2022. 
We posted an appendix on C to the initiative some time ago, uh, elaborating on what the uh, overall methodology is about and some numbers uh, to assess the, the performance of that methodology. We understand that it's kind of cryptic information, and as part of this initiative, we want to do a, a more expansive work on assessing that methodology. Next slide, please. And what you see here is the one of the summaries that we have in this appendix C of the FRP initiative. And we were comparing the performance of the quantile regression, uh, labeled with the letter Q, versus the current approach, that is the histogram uh, labeled with the letter H. And we were comparing different ways to, to assess the performance. And one of them, obviously, is on average the, the megawatt requirement that we would achieve for the KISO and for some EIM areas that we did at that time. And if you compare, for instance, the requirement column, the, the second group of columns, you can see in a very aggregated fashion the difference of requirements with one or the other methodology. We are doing right now more analysis and we're going to be able to provide more analytics in terms of the performance of this methodology. And let me just move to the next slide and I will take a couple of questions. And the idea is that first we want to do a more systematic analysis, not just for the KISO, but also for all the AM areas that are participating in the Western energy market and assess how the quantile methodology is going to perform for these uh, areas. Uh, naturally, the reference is going to be a comparison against the current approach. And uh, we, we have some variables to to analyze and decide uh, what would be the, the best approach to, to implement. Uh, for instance, one of those is what historical period we are going to take, right? And we, we run into the same challenges that we have been running with the histogram. Uh, how far can you go without uh, introducing seasonality that doesn't belong to the time that you are assessing? If you are assessing requirements for February, it wouldn't make much sense to rely on seasonal conditions of August. So we, we have this barrier of how far we can go to take this historical data. And there are some options we are exploring that is going to be part of the assessment that we are going to be presenting. Uh, once we have these requirements calculated, the natural consequence of that is that we can then assess on the, the new requirements using the quantile calculation how the resource efficiency test have played back in 2021. Effectively, we replaced the requirements of the current approach histogram with the new requirements of the quantile, and we assess uh, how the, the failures of the test uh, change, and whether they increase, decrease, they stay about the same using this new approach. And that is something that we have in a scope. And as part of the assessment, we also want to go further into the analysis of the intertide deviation adders. We put an uh, analysis report as part of the resource efficiency evaluation in the last round, where we provide some basic information of the performance of the intertide deviation adder. We want to, to take it back and do a more com comprehensive analysis of that. And potentially, there will be a point in time when we have to to put the two together. We want you to take into account the uncertainty component and the interplay deviation component. Is there any merit to consider those as one single other? That is something that is in the in the projection of the of the scope of this uh, part. And we also heard uh, that there are some participants with an interest to be able to do the calculation by themselves. And for that, we need to ensure that you have a more detailed description of what the calculation is. And we are working on providing that information so that you can really basically have all the requirements that you will need to go from A to Z in order to be able to, to replicate the calculation. We are expecting to post that as part of this uh, analytics effort so that anybody that wants to, to do the calculation by themselves, they know exactly what the steps to take to, to mirror the calculation that we are expecting to implement. I think we have at least a couple of hands uh, here. Uh, operator, let's go with them, please. 
Sure. Moving on to the first caller, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Hi, good morning, Guillermo. This is Jeff Spires with PowerX. Uh, just a couple Hi, of yeah. comments. Uh, a couple of comments on the first, particularly with respect to the the load conformance and the interaction of the EIM and HASP. Uh, but first of all, I, I just wanted to say that uh, I, I appreciate the CAISO um, uh, responding to the, the stakeholder feedback that that you received from us and from others about continuing to talk about these topics and, and uh, doing more analysis to try to find solutions on the areas that we're still uh, trying to work through here. So I, I really appreciate that we're having this discussion today and that we're gonna keep moving forward on some of these remaining topics. My comment uh, to do with the, the load conformance and the HASP interaction is you know, maybe starting with the load conformance first. I, I think, you know, fundamentally, I think what we're trying to really understand is what is the extent to which load biasing is contributing to uh, scenarios in which EIM imports are addressing a capacity or flexibility shortfall. Uh, I think that's fundamentally what we, we're trying to understand, and that's hopefully then going to inform what are the right resource efficiency improvements that are needed to address that. And I, I, I recognize as well that the solution does need to include addressing this export issue that you were just describing in which um, the interaction between advisory EIM imports and HASP can result in exports that would potentially cause the CAISO to fail had those exports not cleared. And I, I, I think that that needs to be part of the solution as well. And we're supportive of finding a means to, to prevent that from occurring. So I think the analysis that you laid out, which is focused on the tighter days, um, seems pretty logical to me and I think that's a great place to start and particularly from the perspective of the capacity test. Um, but I just wanted to give feedback that I think some more thought about the impact of the flex test is also important. You know, just reviewing some of what the MSC was discussing, um, our focus in a lot of our previous dialogue about load conformance has really been focused on the capacity test but I think we know there are issues with the flex test as well. And so, you know, one of the concerns we have with that is that, that the, the impacts on the flexibility side could be something that occur uh, outside of those critical days, could be even in different seasons when you might have, say, in a non-summer day, um, a, a larger net load ramp and some of the concerns around the impact of load conformance on the flex test may be coming up in those other periods. And so I, I would suggest we give some thought here to potentially looking at some of those other scenarios as well, because I think ultimately what we would like to get to is a solution of what do we need to do both in terms of the capacity test and the flex test to address um, some of the results and inaccuracies that might stem from load conformance. Uh, so th that's basically just what I wanted to point out. I think it needs to cover both of those tests. Um, but otherwise, I think the, the general approach that you're suggesting uh, seems like a, a good path forward. Thank you, Jeff, for the comments. And I would really appreciate that you could take a minute later to put all this on route so we can really memorialize those and not miss this. Uh, and I get your point that it's good to start with the peak days. Uh, and I get your point that there may be other dynamics happening outside this uh, high low days that we may be able to explore. And yeah, point taken. Moving on to the next caller. Please go ahead, our line is unmuted. Thank you, Armando. Dan Williams from Customized Energy Solutions. Um, so just uh, definitely uh, support everything that, that Jeff just said. It, especially the appreciation for, you know, the Kaiso getting right on this and, and continuing to dig deeper on these issues. Um, kind of to that end on, I guess it's uh, items one and two, um, I'm really hoping that we can work to get a, a full picture as, or as full of a picture as we can on these different types of days and kind of the, the drivers that were going on in the market. 
And a, a piece that I've asked about before that I think would be useful to you know, have as part of the conversation is to make sure that we're looking at kind of the the volume and price of HASP import bids, um, just you know, intertie hourly block import bids that were available when the market was was clearing these uh, EIM transfers, and then also the uh, volume and price of additional EIM capacity and sort of the the ETSR volume that was available for imports to Kaiso, just to you know, make sure that we kind of have the full picture of what is. Um, sort of driving the different market outcomes or what maybe an alternative market outcome could have been if if we pulled away, you know, X, Y, or Z as available supply or something like that. Um, so that's one of them. And then also just as we're capturing that to, especially on these peak days, to capture whether the HASP, um, the new uh, bid cost recovery rule that went into place back for summer of 2021, whether that was in place, because um, that's maybe a driver in understanding uh, maybe why the, the import bids were shaping up the way that they were, um, plus the offer cap status or what the, the calculated um, maximum import bid price was during these intervals as well. So just kind of some other things to, you know, to fill in the landscape um, as you're you know, pulling the data together. Yeah, and then I just have a question on that just to, to make sure which I understand which topic you're referring to. When you refer to a feature that we implemented in the summer, are you referring to the uplift the payments to interdite transactions or the one that we implemented in February last year of the interdite deviation settlements? And which one are you referring to? Potentially both. The uh, Specifically the uplift payments, just, you know, the, okay. the make whole payments for has hourly block imports. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Hey, operator, do we have any other question on queue? I do not see any other callers in the queue as of now. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, along the questions and comments that we're receiving, uh, we want to make sure that we create the, the room, the space to be able to tackle any other area of analysis that could be relevant to this topic of the resource options evaluation phase 1B. Uh, I would like to put this as a placeholder. Uh, there may be other comments that we receive through this initiative that uh, ideally we would like to package as a, as a track, but we want to ensure that we, we are explicit to indicate that we are still open to consider other factors that are relevant to this discussion. We don't want to confine ourselves uh, prematurely to only these areas if there are other areas that become quite of interest and relevant to the discussion. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just a sketch time frame. Uh, it's not precise, just to give you a rough idea of the timeline. And uh, we want to ensure that we have sufficient time to do a diligent analysis of all these areas. So right now we are somewhere in the middle of March. We are expecting to receive comments by the, actually by March 2nd. So I think by the first week of March, we can have a consolidated scope of the analysis that we want to undertake in this uh, round. And we're going to take effectively the three or potentially four uh, tracks. One that is the quantile analysis, the load conformance, the export EIM transfers, and the and potentially any other area. And they are not listed in the same way they were listed in the previous slide, just because of the nature and the complexity of the work, um, because we're already working in all of those. So based on that, this is just a projection, so please uh, keep in mind that the times are still a little bit uncertain, but our projection is that we can come with a first round of the analysis and material to be provided first with the quantile logic that would be somewhere in the middle of March, and then with the analysis and load conformance towards the second half of March. Then I would expect that we can have a follow-up call just to see uh, the information that we have provided, see the reaction from the market participants, and have an opportunity to go back to the whiteboard and expand and uh, adjust the analysis to cover any pending items, such that we can have a final version of that specific track for analysis towards the end of 
May, as you can see in the first two areas. Then uh, we are going to be working in parallel in the area of the export EIM transfers. We're expecting to have a, a first round of that analysis by mid-April, followed by a first round of the analysis of the intertide deviation by the second half of April. And again, have a, a stakeholder call to socialize the analysis that we have done and have some feedback and be able to come back to the to the whiteboard and potentially expand, adjust the analysis as needed. And the expectation is that all these three tracks and potentially any new one that we have can be all finalized by the end of May. So that by end of May, we can have a final stakeholder call, go over the four, three areas of analysis, and that will basically put a closure to the analysis phase. And that will create the, the starting point to start the discussion with the policy effort. Uh, let me see if we have any questions about the schedule before we move into the bigger framework of the overall initiative. I think we have a question from Dan. Operator? Yes. Uh, please go ahead. The line is unmuted. Hi, Dan from Customized Energy Solutions again. I um, meant to ask this earlier, but um, uh, Dr. Harvey had brought up in the in the MSC opinion just questions around the impact of uh, FRP pricing on transfers. Um, and I'm apolo I apologize if I missed if you already addressed that, but is that something that you have thought about as, as scope for this? Yeah, and uh, we're actually, well, I don't know if you hear the discussion we have with MSC last Friday, Dan, and we covered specifically FRP. Yes, you are right. There may be, there is an interaction, right? It is part of the overall optimization, and there will be an interaction of FRP with anything else in the market. I think you are raising a good question whether that should be potentially tackled as an independent FRP topic or should be brought into any of these areas. I would like to give, me, give myself a little bit of room. Potentially, it could be one of the independent areas that we have. and whether we, we tackle that explicitly as an FRP item or not. But we, we have started that work and we presented that first part in the MSC last week. Uh, based on the feedback and based on the scope that we identified for other areas, we may be able to cover that in this fourth track or potentially just keep it as a separate FRP uh, effort. Great, thanks for the reminders. A lot of moving pieces to keep track of uh, right now, so appreciate that. Yeah. Moving on to the next caller. Please go ahead, your line is unmuted. Guillermo, it's Kelly Wells with WPTF. Um, I just have a question on the schedule that you have up here. So you mentioned that comments are actually due not until March 2nd on this call, which I, I appreciate having a little bit more time to think through additional um, metrics that could be included in the scope. But that being said, the first, you guys have kind of the first round of analysis coming out mid-March. Does that give the KISO sufficient time to consider suggested metrics to then turn around a week to two weeks later um, in a formal analysis that's posted? Yeah, or, I can Or do you. we anticipate, yeah. or is any suggested metrics actually gonna come around like maybe the second iteration of the analysis? Yeah, you, you are right on point. Right now, we're already marching towards the deliverables of the first round, and that will not change based on the immediate uh, feedback that we receive. So we're already on track to, to, to do that first part. If there is something that is naturally associated with the effort that we are already taking, we potentially could include it, but most likely it's going to be fit into getting the final version in the second round. Okay, I had a feeling you guys are probably already kind of working down, working through some metrics, so that, I appreciate that, thank you. You're welcome. I do, do not see any, any other callers yeah. in the. Uh, yeah, I do not see any other callers in the queue as of now. Okay, uh, with that, I think we can move into the overall time schedule, and I will send it over to Danny. Danny, I think you're on mute. Please unmute and proceed. Thank you. Uh, 
So as you can see from the schedule, the, the next deliverable would be the comments on the analysis being due March 2nd. Uh, as Guillermo just presented on the rest of the slides, we would aim to have the analysis done kind of at the end of May, start of June. We would then look to issue a straw proposal near the end of June, give a, have about a week between then and the stakeholder call, give a couple weeks for comments to be submitted by stakeholders. This schedule calls for, I think, three rounds of iteration to the extent that we can do this quicker are in two rounds, we would look to do so, but given the complexity of some of these topics, we just wanted to initially put this out there as, as this seems reasonable. The other thing I wanted to note that Guillermo didn't cover today was the consideration of emergency actions. Uh, that policy item doesn't need more analysis to inform further policy making, so it's not explicitly identified as part of phase 1B, I believe the ISO is actually looking to have a stakeholder workshop near the end of last week to start the discussion on how to proceed on that item. To the extent that we're able to coalesce uh, around a policy, we would look to move forward with that independently. Else that I think it would likely end up as part of the phase 1B policy making process. So I do see there's a comment in the, or a question in the queue. Yes, um, let me unmute their line. Please go ahead, your line is unmuted. Hi, Danny, it's Lindsay Schluckway from NV Energy. Um, I was actually exactly, you just pointed out exactly what I wanted to discuss. I was wondering um, for that additional item, is that something that Kaiso would be willing to um, pull out and implement sooner than this? Because this wouldn't be, this wouldn't go to the body until December. And we were kind of hoping to get something in place prior to summer if possible. Yeah, I think, I think our plan would be not to propose to tie it to phase 1B initially. It's really gonna be dependent upon uh, if through that workshop, it's clear that, that the stakeholder community is able to coalesce around something that that we would want to, that everybody would want to be implemented by uh, summer. I, given that we're now in mid-February, I, I think the chances of implementing something really complex by summer uh, may be limited, but I would reserve that discussion for next week's uh, stakeholder workshop. Okay, yeah, I agree. I think a simple approach would work best. Um, okay, and when when is, when is that scheduled for next week? I didn't see it. I think, it, it, I think we should ideally be getting out the market notice uh, a little bit later today. So I, I think it's supposed to be midday Wednesday, I, I think is when we tentatively have it scheduled. Okay, perfect, thank you. I do not see any other callers in the queue as of now. But looks like there is a comment in the chat. Um, Alexandra, would you uh, mind reading it? She has. The comment is from CEC, and it is fully support the request and themes expressed by Dan Williams. To that end, KISO should consider making the price and volume data of every market cleared by the KISO available for both critical days of interest in this and related initiatives and generally on OASIS. A model for this may be the day ahead market summary report from OASIS. Okay, yeah, uh, we saw the, the feedback and we will consider that in, in the process. Thank you, Guillermo. There are no further questions in the chat. Okay, well, that's all what we have for today. Thank you for your time. And let's see, we have one last round for any questions that may be still pending. Otherwise, we can conclude the call. I don't see any questions in the queue or the chat. So I'll go okay. ahead and wrap up this call. Thank you for joining you. today's discussion. Thank you for I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for joining today's discussion. As a reminder, this meeting was recorded for informational and convenience purposes only. The video file will be posted on the initiative webpage for a limited time after this meeting. We look forward to receiving your comments on today's discussion by end of day, March 2nd. 
and have a great rest of your day.